We are about to drop a bomb on this episode of the Big Bass Podcast. It's our third and final installment on David Hayes and his world record smallmouth bass. At the end of this show, you'll know more than you ever imagined about that fish. And just like us, you'll be wondering what's going to happen next. We've been telling the story about David Lee Hayes uh, and his 1955 smallmouth bass from Dale Hollow that stood as a world record and as two state records for 41 years before allegations of fish tampering uh, caused it to be decertified by the IGFA and the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame and the state of Kentucky. Uh, only Tennessee uh, kept the, the Hayes fish as their record. That's right, Terry. The 1990s. Uh, when all this went down, were tumultuous times for the record-keeping organizations. Not only the smallmouth record, but also the records for muskie and walleye were being challenged and overturned. In 1996, the IGFA and the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame replaced the David Hayes fish with John Gorman's 10-pound, 14-ounce smallmouth, also from Dale Hollow, and Kentucky wound up vacating their smallmouth record and then recognizing a mere 7-pounder in 1998. Tennessee yep. did their own investigation that concluded in 1997, and they wound up keeping Hayes in the books. It led to the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame reinstating Hayes in 1999. Kentucky reinstated Hayes, too. Yeah, because they probably found out that dropping their state record by five pounds really hurt business. It's a bad um, look. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, that, that leaves uh, the IGFA the most... Probably the most respected, you know, of, of all record-keeping organizations in the world. Uh, and and the, the people uh, are usually referencing when they're talking about world records, they're always talking about the IGFA. So why was the F IGFA holding out when all the other record-keepers had reinstated Hayes? Well, you know, according to statements coming from IGFA at that time, they were waiting for evidence that contradicted the allegations against Hayes and tampering with the fish. So they were waiting for evidence to disprove what was in the John Barlow affidavit from 1955. Guilty till proven innocent? Exactly. They had the burden of proof backwards. <laughs> they were all screwed up. Instead of requiring proof to, you know, to, def to, to unseat the record, they should have done their due diligence and investigated the allegations of wrongdoing. Instead, they wound up hurting some people by handling things the way they did and making others do the investigating for them. And that's where the Hayes story got very personal for me and where this episode of the Big Bass Podcast really gets started. So, folks, here in part three, we're going to pick things up a decade later in 2005 when the Hayes smallmouth story takes another turn. Welcome to the Big Bass Podcast, the fishing show where size matters. I'm Ken Duke. And I'm Terry Battisti. Our producer and engineer is Nathan Benson. This is the final installment of our three-part series on David Hayes and the world record smallmouth bass. If you haven't seen the first two episodes, uh, we recommend that you go back and check them out. This episode won't make a lot of sense without him. Plus, there's a lot of great video of the late Mr. Hayes telling the story in his own words. You don't want to miss that. Yeah, that video footage was shot in early 2010 by, by Nathan Benson and myself. Uh, we were at Mr. Hayes' home in Litchfield, Kentucky, and you can see him sitting on his living room sofa as we talk about his catch. Uh, Mr. Hayes died a couple of years ago in 2020 at the age of 95. But my involvement oh, with the smallmouth bass record goes back almost 20 years now to 2005. Which is nuts. I mean, it, it's not often that, you know, here on the Big Bass Podcast, we get to talk to these people that, that, that held or hold these records. So kudos to you, Ken. Um, you know, you, you have personal involvement in this story, uh, but you, and you're really, really closely involved in this. Um, you know, how, how did that come about? Uh, you know, back at that time, Terry, beginning in about 2002 or so, uh, I was making regular trips to Dale Hollow to fish for the, the legendary smallmouth bass there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I heard a lot of stories about the Hayes fish and the circumstances of it being discredited and stricken from the record books. Uh, of course, I, I was had been aware of the fish for decades, ever since I was a, a kid. 
Um, and, and you know, some people around Dale Hollow said the Hayes bass was completely legit. Others sided with IGFA and the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame in the state of Kentucky and thought it should be disqualified. They believed it had been stuffed with three pounds of, of weights and engine parts. Um, I honestly didn't know what to believe at that point, but I knew I wanted to learn a lot more about it, about the man who caught it, and about the circumstances surrounding its becoming a record and then getting disqualified. Uh, I thought then, and I still believe, that the Hayes fish is one of the most fascinating and, and bizarre catches in the history of our sport. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's insane. And of course, you know, obviously the Big Bass podcast wasn't around in uh, 2005. Um, so how did you get involved in the story and help out? Well, in 2005, I was the senior editor of BASS Publications, and I was working on Bassmaster Magazine, Bass Times, Bassmaster.com. And uh, Bassmaster had done a story on the David Hayes fish being disqualified in 1996. Uh, but it mostly just traced the work of a, a man named Eldon Davis, who was a, a, a high school assistant principal and sometimes outdoor writer. And Eldon Davis had his doubts about the Hayes fish. And he found a 40-year-old affidavit in the Corps of Engineers office uh, in Salina, Tennessee, that alleged fish tampering way back in 1955. That's when a fishing guide claimed to have put three pounds of weights in the Hayes fish. That story fascinated me. It was compelling. It was very one-sided, though. Uh, there was nothing from any of the people who were there and who thought the fish was legitimate. Mm -hmm. I thought this might be the last chance to do any real research and investigating on the catch because by that point, by 2005, the catch was 50 years old and most yeah. of the people involved were, were gone. Uh, yeah. Luckily, though, a few were still around, including David Hayes, who was 80 years old when I first met him in 2005. Wow. All right, so let's do a recap of, of what's going on here. We got the catch. You know, David Hayes catches an 11-pound, 15-pound, 15 15-ounce 15 smallmouth uh, July 9th, 1955 from the Kentucky side of Dale Hollow. That's pretty much all. Everybody knows that. Uh, it was world recognized by the... Uh, the field and stream who kept world records at the time. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, what did Hayes get from it? He got a hundred dollar savings bond from field and stream uh, from their fishing contest. Uh, he got some bomber baits. And then in 1960, 1996, uh, El Eldon Davis hosts the big buck show in Livingston, Tennessee, uh, invites Hayes to attend uh, with his mounted fish and, uh, Davis is told by, you know, people that th this fish does not look like a, a fish that would weigh close to 12 pounds. Uh, then he hears rumors, uh, you know, about, you know, people doctoring this fish to weigh what it did at 1115. And then somehow he finds an affidavit from a John Barlow claiming that the fish had been stuffed with three pounds of lower unit parts and lead. Uh, and then supposedly Barlow takes a polygraph and passes it, uh, made up from questions from Eldon Davis himself. Yeah, uh, and that was that led to the the unseating of David Hayes's record catch. Uh, IGFA and the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame decertified the fish, took it out, took it out of their record books. Mm -hmm. uh, Kentucky, which is actually where he caught the fish, he caught the fish in the Kentucky section of Dale Hollow Lake. They disqualified it as their state record. Uh, all these all these entities replaced Hayes's fish with other fish and and it really damaged the reputation of the man who owns Cedar Hill Resort Dick Roberts and, and it, yeah. it obviously took a lot of the took a lot of the enthusiasm for fishing and and for his record away from David Hayes too uh, even though nobody alleged that Hayes had done anything wrong or that he had been a part of of this incident uh, you know certainly people whispered behind his back and people wondered if maybe there was something sinister to his activities right yeah and, and then so you know the, the tide turns you know uh tennessee decides to do its own investigation uh there was a gentleman by the name of ron fox 
who is the Assistant Executive Director for the TWRA, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, uh, who he worked for for 37 years before retiring in 2009. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he probably was the only person, you know, up to that point that, that did the right thing by thinking that an investigation was the responsible thing to do. Uh, but he didn't have much confidence. You know, he, he thought that, that he was going to come up with the same conclusion that everybody else had come up with. Yeah, uh, exactly. He, uh, he thought that he'd just go down the same path, but he thought Hayes deserved it. He thought Hayes deserved uh, a chance to, uh, to be heard and to mm -hmm. look into this fish. And he ultimately came to believe that, uh, that David Hayes' catch was legit. Right, exactly. Yeah, and then you had folks like yourself, you know, that... Yeah, I was not the first outdoor writer to, to kind of be involved in the story. Other people were trying to tell the story, um, but I didn't think they were doing it very effectively. And mm -hmm. I didn't think they were really... I like to call it connecting the dots. Um, they would, they would point Typical out this lawyer. Or, or that. Typical lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got, you've got to, you got to tell a story. You got to, you got to piece public things together. Pu public defender can do. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> none of that. None of that. Um, I like, I'm, I'd like to think I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a better case than that. But, uh, but you had people who would say, oh, you know, well, you know, uh, the polygraph questions were created by Eldon Davis and David Hayes sure is a nice man, but they didn't really put the whole fabric of the story together to make a really compelling case for David Hayes. And I thought that was one of the ways they were falling short. They just weren't digging deep enough or connecting those dots. The other thing I had going for me at the time, Terry was uh, I'm senior editor of publications at Bass and, and I've, yep. I've got Bassmaster magazine uh, behind me to a degree. And, and so that's a, that's a pretty bully pulpit, you know, that, that reaches yep. 525,000 BASS members and, and pretty much everybody who's serious about the sport is getting that magazine. Yep. And, uh, Absolutely. and so that was, that was a, a nice position to be in. I felt like, uh, I felt like if, if Hayes's catch was legit and I could write a good enough story that with that platform, I could make something happen and, and get IGFA to turn around on their attitude about the catch. Right. So at, at, at this point, now you, you have to start investigating the cast of characters here. So yeah. let's, I, let's dig into those folks and, and, and talk about what you found out about these people. Like who the hell was John H. Barlow? Yeah. Uh, in a nutshell, of course, John Barlow, was the guy who claimed to be on the dock at Cedar Hill Resort on July 9th, 1955, when David Hayes brought his giant smallmouth in. Uh, that's mm -hmm. where the Hayes family kept their boat in that marina. That's where they were staying. And John H. Barlow claimed to be there that day, claimed he got hold of the fish, claimed that, that the owner of the resort, Dick Roberts, told him to, to do it up good and loaded up with, with sinkers and motor parts to add a lot of weight to it. And, uh, and John Barlow, I did dug into John Barlow, wanted to find out more about him. Is he somebody who could be trusted? Found out he would have been 37 years old at the time of the Hayes catch. He was a, a sometimes Dale Hollow fishing guide. He had a lousy reputation for telling the truth. Uh, his, his younger brother, Ira, uh, refuted the story that that John Barlow told until Ira's dying breath. Uh, John Barlow's nephew, Ira's son, called John Barlow a career liar. Jeez. This is his family wow. calling him out. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, that's, that's not good. I'm supposed to believe this man, this is, this is the linchpin. This is the star witness of the case against David Hayes, and, and you got his family calling him a career liar. Um, and wow. you know, even though he passed a polygraph test, those questions were prepared by Eldon Davis, a man who, who seemed to have an ax to grind about the record. Uh, TWRA, under the leadership of Ron Fox, who you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency brought in an expert from Ohio, 
uh, who, who practiced something called statement analysis. And, and he didn't have access to John Barlow at that point because he had passed away. But in looking at his, his document, the affidavit, this guy was able to find many areas of what he thought were deception in the affidavit. Mm -hmm. um, Barlow died in 1997, uh, eight years before I started digging into this, and just a year after his affidavit was rediscovered, uh, and way before he could be given another polygraph by TWRA. Right. Um, so yeah, that, so what did, what did uh, Barlow's... And I should say John Barlow, because there's a few Barlows oh that my are involved in the God, story. Terry, there are so many Barlows. <laughs> so what many did, Barlows. What were, what were the claims that this affidavit put forth? Yeah, the first thing that uh, I think the, the biggest thing he says is that the fish actually weighed three pounds less than the weight we're all accustomed to talking about. Uh, we're all accustomed to talking about the world record being at 11 pounds, 15 ounces. John Barlow claimed that fish weighed eight pounds. 15 ounces uh, mm -hmm. and then he stuffed three pounds of sinkers and motor parts into it well one of the problems with that is that david hayes took the fish to another marina before he ever got to cedar hill he took it yep. to a place called wisdom dock to fill up mm -hmm. with gas and there uh a dock hand named lightning madison uh <laughs> got hold of the fish and weighed it and and Lightning Madison reported the fish weighed 1115 there, hours before Hayes got to Cedar Hill. Yeah. Uh, at this point in time, Lightning Madison is still alive. And he passed a polygraph saying that he was telling the truth about the weight of the fish at that point. And this was a yeah. polygraph that, that TWRA sponsored and, and came up with the questions for and so forth. So you got one guy saying that thing is not legit. You got one guy saying it is legit, and they've each passed a polygraph. Yep. Uh, also at uh, Wisdom Doc, you've got a, um, a a wildlife game warden named Oral Bertram, who uh, also said he saw the fish weighed, and it was 1115. Unfortunately, by this time, 2005, Oral Bertram is long gone. He died in 1971, so there was mm -hmm. no interviewing him at that point. Um, there are multiple Cedar Hill witnesses who were there uh, when John Barlow claims to have been there who say the fish weighed 1115. Uh, if you recall, this is, as we said earlier, this is back in a time in the mid-1990s when all these old records were being challenged. Uh, the yeah, walleye the record, record, the musky <laughs> record, and now the smallmouth record. And they're going down. They're going down like flies. And, yep. and the the, uh, the walleye record, the Mabry Harper, I think it was 1960 record uh, out of Arkansas, I think it was. Um, it, it was 25 pounds, but uh, an outdoor writer and biologist from Minnesota named Dick Sternberg got a hold of the photo and uh, did an analysis of it and determined that the, the Mabry Harper fish could not have weighed more than 17, 18 pounds. Well, TWRA, Ron Fox saw that. And so they took pictures of the Hayes fish to Dick Sternberg. He did his, he did analysis. his Ouija board thing and uh, <laughs> analysis. Thank you. And uh, said, oh, no, this fish absolutely weighed 12 pounds. Yeah. Uh, now, that's great. And, and, and I like it. And, and I do believe that, that the proportions were right for the Hayes fish to weigh 11, 15 but I also think I should point out that that Mabry Harper fish has been in and out of the record books multiple times since Dick Sternberg's analysis. So Sternberg helped to get it knocked out of the record books, but that thing has, has nine lives and it's come back and, and has been fairly well supported since then. Mm -hmm. uh, this one blew me away. The next one I want to mention to you, Terry, just absolutely blew me away. You know, you think, my God three pounds of lead sinkers and motor parts into a, a, a smallmouth bass? Well, absolutely. I, I got a display. You can get three pounds of sinkers and motor parts into a five pound smallmouth bass. You don't need an 815. You can get it into a five pounder. And, and if that fish is just laying there and you don't have a chance to, to feel the fish, it doesn't necessarily look horribly unnatural 
That's uh, insane. That, I, that I, astonished I would never, me. And, and, and where did you get, the, who told you that? Or Well, did, Ron Fox. I saw, I saw, I saw it done. And, uh, uh and it's astonishing how much, <laughs> yeah, the fish did not survive, but you know, that kind of test kind of needed to be done just to, just to test the veracity of it. Because if, if it couldn't be done, if it could not be done, then you'd know, well, that, that really does blow the John Barlow story out of the water, but it mm -hmm. can be done. You can get a tremendous amount of weight into a fish's body without making it look hopelessly suspicious. Now, what you can't do is fool somebody who's actually holding the fish. There's right. no way. Because they're going to feel that, that hard material inside, kind of like, you know, what happened with our walleye friends, uh, maybe not friends, uh, a few months back. Yeah, the guys who got caught cheating in that walleye tournament, or Sandy DeFresco, yep. for that matter. Uh, Although but, that uh, fish, yeah, that fish, they didn't feel it until the taxidermist actually you know, got the fish and cleaned it. I mean, you're talking about a 20 pound class fish with a two and a half pound dive weight in it. Right. Yeah. You're um, talking, yeah. The, the proportions are, all... are much different. That's, that's almost a 10% yeah. difference. Whereas in the, in the right. Hayes circumstance, that would have been uh, a 40% difference. Um, yeah, exactly. Then the other thing that really bothered me about the affidavit that just did not ring true is that John Barlow claims he's there at the dock and he's being told by the dock owner, Dick Roberts, and by his own younger brother, Ira, hey, load this fish up. And, and Dick Roberts is allegedly there with a bunch of sinkers in his hands for him to do it with. Well, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to do something that shady, isn't the last thing you want to do involve a whole lot more people? Yeah, uh, exactly. Who could, who could rat you out and, and bring additional suspicion and, and give greater opportunity for you to be found out? Just seems mm -hmm. kind of inauthentic. Uh, yep. so that all those things about the affidavit really troubled me. Right. Um, there were other witnesses on site, you know, you've got Roberts himself, you got Ira Barlow. Um, you know, what about, what did you find out about those guys? Yeah. Uh, Dick Roberts, uh, the Roberts family owned that Marina mm -hmm. from the time Dale hollow was built until around 2000 and, 10 or so they they, mm -hmm. they did sell it about then and uh the main operators of course uh, were dick roberts who was the original owner uh he had a tremendous reputation in the community i did not find anybody who did not think highly of dick roberts who had passed away about a dozen years earlier in 1993 but everybody had a super high opinion of this guy said there was no way they could believe he would do something as shady as as uh, led down a fish uh he was a sunday school teacher for 40 plus years not that that yeah. makes him you know sin proof by any means but that that may speak to the caliber of person he was his involvement in the community and so forth ira yeah. barlow uh john barlow's younger brother uh john being the guy who claimed he did all this stuff with the weights Ira worked at Cedar Hill Resort. He was a mechanic and sometimes ran the desk there. And uh, everybody agrees that Ira was there that day. Everybody says Ira was there. But Ira says John was not there. Mm -hmm. Ira says the bad guy in this story, by all accounts, including John's account, because he admits to, or say, says he shoved these weights on the fish's throat, uh, nobody else says John was there except John. Uh, yeah. They all say he had been fired weeks earlier uh, by Dick Roberts because John was constantly complaining that he didn't get enough guide work. Uh, constantly moping about this, about that. Uh, also, Ira, on his deathbed, uh, told his son that the Hayes catch was legit uh, and that John had fabricated the entire story. And that was something mm -hmm. that he didn't just say on his deathbed. That was something that he said for out for, throughout the last years of his life. There's another guy, Bobby Stone. What about him? Oh, yeah. Bobby Stone. Interesting, interesting story there. Bobby Stone uh, was a young man at the time. He'd have been 20 years old when uh, this fish came in. And uh, he was the night watchman or the night attendant at the marina. Uh 
and and he slept on the freezer that the fish was in. <laughs> Bobby Stone slept on the freezer. He posed with pictures with the fish, and uh, he said there's no way that fish was tampered with. If that fish had weights in it, he would have felt them, and he slept on it, so there was no way anybody else could get to it. Uh, Bobby Stone later served as the, the tax collector in uh, Clay County or the city of Salina for many, many years, was elected to that office multiple times, as had been his father before him. He was a guy people trusted and respected. Um, I had a, a nice conversation uh, with Mr. Stone, who also told me a lot, a lot about the reputation of, of uh, John Barlow. But uh, Bobby Stone was was there all night, and that was where he slept. He slept on top of that freezer, so that nobody could get to that that fish, which everybody knew was was going to be a world record. So now we come back to the affidavit, which was submitted 39 days after the catch, uh, and it was prepared by an attorney named Jimmy Renault. What about yeah. Jimmy Renault? Yeah, that's where, to me, it really got interesting. You know, I had seen or heard about a lot of this other stuff before that, about Bobby Stone sleeping on the freezer, about Dick Roberts teaching Sunday school, about the bad reputation that uh, John Barlow had for telling the truth. But I started to dig into it. I was curious about this affidavit. I guess that's the ex-lawyer in me, Dr. Battisti. I wanted to know more mm -hmm. about that. Where did that come from? Because when you read the affidavit, the one thing that is certain is that a, a fishing guide from rural Tennessee did not write this document. There is no mm -hmm. way. Yep. The, the language just doesn't line up. Too I much legalese. <laughs> too much legalese. Too much wherefore. Too much this, that. Uh, the affidavit was prepared by an attorney named Jimmy Renault, uh, who at that time would have been about 40 years old. And, and here's what's interesting about Jimmy Renault. Uh, <laughs> he owned a rival marina on the lake. Imagine that. Imagine that. He owned Holly Creek Resort on the same body of water just across the lake. It was a, it was a competing business. And, and, and Jimmy and Renault... Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, you know, you're talking about the mid 50s, you know, through the, the early 60s. Big fish is what brought patrons to these lakes, you know, throughout the, you know, the South and, and whatever. And if you have good things being said about the fishing at the, out of the marina that you're working at, you're going to get more business. Absolutely. And, and, and I mean, it's, it's huge. I mean, it, there's a, a series of, fishing annuals that was put out by a guy named Don Fulsch back in the in the 60s and you know the glowing reports of fish being caught and stuff like that I mean this is what drove business to these places specifically these marinas and Dale Hollow produced big fish like no other smallmouth body of water ever yep. in fact uh, you know Hayes caught his fish in 1955 and Dale Hollow was impounded in 1942. His fish, Terry, was 13 years old. When they checked it and did yep. a scale count and so forth, it, it was one of the first, it was in that first brood stock uh, of Dale Hollow wow. fish. And, and boom, uh, almost a 12 pounder. So Jimmy Renault, the guy who prepares the affidavit that is the, the core document to all this, he owned Holly Creek Resort. A competing yep. business. Now, Jimmy was not around to interview in 2005 because in 1981, he took a sawed-off shotgun, placed it against his chest, and pulled the trigger. So he, he committed suicide in, in 81. Felt guilty uh, about what he did to David Hayes. Well, I don't know about that. I'm sure he had a variety of issues that would, yes. have, would have driven him to that. But uh, but he was he was at least uh, he was he was being well served by having this affidavit out there. Uh, the notary, because a, a, an affidavit, of course, is a sworn document. Yep. The notary of this affidavit was uh, a woman known as Oopi Renault. And Oopi Renault was the younger sister of Jimmy Renault. 
and she was also the county court clerk. So wow, if you think there might be some home cooking going on here, yep, you're you're right about that. There was a lot of home cooking going on with this <laughs> affidavit. Now let's take a look at who delivered the affidavit to the Corps of Engineers office. It was uh, a relative of John Barlow, a guy by the name of Raymond Barlow, who we've talked about at the top of the show. His nickname was Doughbelly. And, and uh, Doughbelly Barlow uh, spent his working career mostly as a deputy sheriff. And he had a reputation, uh, the word that, that came up over and over when I asked people about Doughbelly, who died in 1975, by the way, the word that was used a lot to describe him was brutal. Apparently, he uh, was not hesitant to, to rough some people up. Nice. Uh, and uh, not the greatest reputation. But you know what else he was, Terry? He was also a, guide. a fishing guide. <laughs> yep. And guess where he guided out of? Oh, it, it couldn't have been Renault's uh, marina. It, it was, in fact, Renault's marina. Imagine and, that. Uh, and he was known to be a very jealous guy about uh, if other anglers were more successful than he was so it's either i can't remember now i apologize but usually holly hill or holly creek uh resort was the one that renault owned and where where uh Dobelly barlow uh worked as a guide so uh, that's a real problem you know everybody involved in that john barlow affidavit either had an axe to grind with dick roberts yep who owned cedar hill or they stood to gain financially by disgracing Cedar Hill Resort. Yep. Uh, and although John Barlow had passed a lie detector test uh, with the questions prepared by Eldon Davis, uh, it's also true that Lightning and Madison at Wisdom Dock, who weighed the fish at 1115, and Ira Barlow, the brother of John Barlow, who said that John Barlow was a career liar, they also took polygraphs and passed them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they completely refuted the claims made by John Barlow. And, and so uh, these things are just mounting up and mounting up. And, and I'm coming to the conclusion pretty quickly that um, while there is some, there's some smoke around this fish, there's not any fire that I can see. And, it's um, a smear campaign. It's, a, it's, it's potentially just a nasty smear campaign. And at worst, at worst, if you're looking at it from David Hayes' perspective, at worst, they don't have enough to knock him out of the record books. The burden yeah. should not be on him to stay in the record books. The burden should be on the detractors who are trying to say he doesn't deserve to stay there. And they, they don't have a meaningful case. Yep. Well, and the, the crazy thing is, is that you know, the, the affidavit was filed 39 days after the record was caught, and then 40 years later, you know, somehow it gets brought back to the limelight. Uh, what the hell? I mean, the, the, the Army Corps didn't want anything to do with it, and of course it probably wasn't their authority to do any, anything with it, but holy crap, I mean, it's just a, the and you story raise itself a, is just crazy. You raise a great point there because... Uh, Eldon Davis, who is the guy who kind of, when that affidavit resurfaced, somebody gave him the a heads up. The lead shit disturber. <laughs> somebody gave Eldon Davis a heads up that there was a document at the core office that he needed oh, to check out. But Eldon yeah. Davis, to my knowledge, has never revealed who that person was. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we wanted to have Eldon Davis on the show. We're not able to track him down. Uh, the numbers I, I could find for him did not. Either, either he did not answer or he, he simply didn't call back. Uh, and the email I had for him bounced back. So if anybody knows Eldon Davis, we're going to give our emails at the end of the show. Please, please have him get in touch. We'd, yeah. we'd be, happy to give him, be happy to give him an audience here. Um, so so let's, let's now go to the article that you wrote in the uh, October 2005 issue of Bassmaster Magazine. After you've done all this research. Um, yeah, uh, I called it uh, the case for David Hayes. Uh, at that point, I felt like I had dotted the I's and crossed the T's, and and I knew I had the right the right platform in Bassmaster Magazine to tell mm -hmm. the story, and and hopefully to get the International Game Fish Association to do the right thing. Uh, 
I went into a great deal of detail in that article. Um, I actually have more information now, uh, 18 years later, as you can imagine, and you and I have, have left no stone unturned to uh, pull this story together. And, and so while I hope some folks will go back and, and read that article, um, what you're getting here is in many, in many ways more thorough and detailed. Yeah. Yeah. So IGFA ends up reinstating the fish on the 12th of December, 2005, essentially because of the work that you did, the investigative work that should have been done years prior. Um, so I don't think, hats off to that. I know. don't think IGFA would, would agree with that statement, but I, I, <laughs> I can tell you that they didn't move when, when other people had told the story, when the story had been told on other platforms, although without as much detail, without all the backstory about the affidavit and so forth, they didn't, uh, they didn't budge. In fact, again, they refused to reopen the file because they said there was no evidence to refute the affidavit. Again, looking at it backwards, wow. as you said earlier, so perfectly uh, guilty until proven innocent. Mm -hmm. So what did that letter say that was written by IGFA? Yeah, uh, Rob Kramer was the uh, president of IGFA at the time, and uh, his letter was dated December 12, 2005, to David Hayes. And the part that, the part that, uh, that I really got a kick out of, uh, or perhaps paid the most attention to, was a sentence that reads like this. Uh, IGFA's policy has always been to reinvestigate any record when information is presented challenging its legitimacy. Unfortunately, in this case, the information was inaccurate. We apologize for any inconvenience this matter has caused you over the years. So they reinstated Hayes and they apologized for doing a, well, they didn't apologize for doing a shoddy job, though I think they should have because they did a shoddy job. They apologized that the information they used was not accurate. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they left it at that. They, the only other thing they did for Hayes was they, they made him a lifetime, at, at 80 years old, they made him a lifetime member of the International Game Fish Association. So kudos. Good for to them. IGFA. So, and it, and it was gratifying to see David Hayes reinstated. He was, he was very pleased and, and grateful about it. As a matter of fact, uh, we have a clip of Mr. Hayes talking about uh, being reinstated. And uh, this is, again, from 2010. Nathan's doing the film, and I'm doing the, uh, the off-screen talking here. Let's hear from David Hayes. Now, 10 years later... <clears throat> After a lot of investigation and a lot of t time spent substantiating your story and pointing out that the fellow who claimed all the wrongdoing was notorious for making such things up and, and was trying to maybe uh, get back at his employer at Cedar Hill, your record was reinstated by the International Game Fish Association, by the National Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame, and by the state of Kentucky. The state of Tennessee had always kept you in the record books. Did, did you feel vindicated through that, or was it just just another day, or, you, or had you already made peace with oh, the whole situation? Yes. yes. Of course, it went on for quite a while after it was announced, and uh, I began to put it aside. Okay. So what? I've had it 42 years, you know. Uh, it was accusation that I didn't like. So, yes, I've been very happy about it since. Uh, one thing that pleased me a whole lot, the barber I go to, I just went to him this morning. I've been putting it off. He's got it on the wall. They didn't like it. He's got it on the wall. The record's been reinstated in a picture of it. So that makes me feel good every time I go in there. Yeah. Uh, glad it all turned out okay. And I appreciate the effort made by you and the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife people and Ron 
uh, Fox. Terry, one of the things that, that blew me away in that conversation with David Hayes, after all he had been through, having the record for 41 years, losing the record for 10 years, and then, and then getting it back, uh, was that he actually said he wanted to see his record broken. He wanted to see somebody do it. And Mr. Hayes, uh, you've had the record now almost 55 years. Do you think there's another smallmouth out there that'll break 12 pounds? I hope so. You'd like to see somebody break your record? Yes, sir. Why is that? Well, records are made to be broke, aren't they? Yeah, records are made to be broken. I mean, that's, I mean. His words, exactly. Exactly. And, and I mean, it, it kind of shows you the caliber of the guy, you know. I mean, he likes having the record, but, you know, he's, he's willing and, and hopeful that his record will be broken at some point in time. And I, I assume that he probably wanted to see it happen before he passed. So. I wonder if we'll ever see. I, I, I don't know that I'll live to see that record broken. It's got a, a pretty hefty margin on number two. Uh, you're talking about more than 10% bigger, or about 10% bigger than number two. That's, that's a big gap. Uh, I, I, I feel differently, but we've talked about that in prior episodes, and I'm sure we'll get back into it when we start talking about some of these lakes uh, that, that have the possibility of uh, producing a world record but but you know I, I decided terry in in doing all that research uh writing that story which i think is probably the story i'm most proud of that i've written in my in my uh outdoor writing career that yep. there is there is a thing called there is a thing i'm going to call the curse of the world record smallmouth bass because remember remember all the terrible things that happened to walter harden with his perfectly legitimate <laughs> world record smallmouth bass from the 30s Florida. and 40s, yeah, out of, out Florida, of Florida, Florida, who knew? Um, but you know, it was, global warming's what's driven those fish out of Florida, right? <laughs> exactly. You know it. You know it. Um, but there were there were some there were some pluses and minuses uh, for Hayes. Obviously, he went through a lot of turmoil. Uh, he also enjoyed the record quite a bit. I had kind of the same experience in in, in microcosm and on a much lower dose. Uh, it was great to get uh, have the appreciation of David Hayes. Um, the uh, Roberts family uh, were very, very happy to see their father. They felt he was vindicated. I got mm -hmm. a, a nice letter from them. We'll have to post that here. Um, uh, it felt good to get David Hayes back in the record book, where I, I felt very strongly he belonged. Uh, yep. I got I actually got the key to the county. I got the key oh, to God. Clay County. Tennessee. Clay County, that was the biggest mistake you ever made. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, got, I got written up in the, the Salina newspaper, the Clay County newspapers for a while. I would come to town and those folks were nice enough to, to mention if I was there and what maybe I'd be working on. That was, that was really cool. Uh, you felt like bass fishing had some celebrity at, at that moment because it, bass fishing was in the spotlight you know it wasn't really yep. me it was maybe things i was working on or the Hayes situation or something but to see bass fishing in the spotlight was very cool there were also some hassles about it um i got a letter from uh an attorney saying he represented the renault family and and that i had <laughs> improperly maligned them and defamed them and i just responded by saying dude they I use relatives. Is that how you started it, dear dude? Yes. <laughs> yes, that's that doesn't that's, sound like uh, something that you'd say. <laughs> well, no, it's not probably something I said or, or, or replied to. And of course, didn't have the guts to to write me directly. I had to write it to my boss. Uh, yeah. Same situation for my GFA. Um, the one of the IGFA officials wrote uh, an ugly letter to my boss. Um, complaining about some of the things I said in uh, in the story, all of which were true. The mm -hmm. only thing I did that I regret about that story was I did misspell this guy's name multiple times, this IGFA official's name multiple times. Oh, that times. sucks. I, I don't think he's a, a bad guy at all. I think he was just trying to come to the defense of his organization when they were yeah. in a the indefensible position. 
let's say. Right. Uh, he was trying to defend them as keepers and, and standard bearers on freshwater fishing when they are not that. Um, so what about, there's some quirky things that, that, that go with this story. Yeah, I've, I've mentioned this to you before, and it's just kind of, because I like to do the, the deep, quirky dive into the personalities associated with a story like this, um, Ruth Hayes, David Hayes' wife of almost 70 years, passed away in, uh, they were married as teenagers, passed away in 2012, uh, and she died on the anniversary of his record of that catch. Fish catch. Yeah. Yep. On July 9th. David Hayes himself passed away two days before the anniversary of that catch. And I think that's that's really, really unusual and odd. And yep. uh, and, and you know, I don't wanna I don't want our show to end without um, giving a, a plug to a gentleman I haven't seen in, in years since this all was going on, but I have a high opinion of. Uh, his name is Darren Shell. And, and Darren is a historian. He's a writer. Uh, I, I don't know if he still owns Willow Grove Resort and Marina on Dale Hollow, but he did it one time, if he does not still. Uh, but he is a local historian of the area there around Dale Hollow, and he's absolutely fantastic. He's written a number of books including a couple of books that focus on the smallmouth bass fishing there. Uh, yep. One is called uh, uh, The History of Dale Hollow Lake, which was published in 2008. Uh, and another one, a favorite of mine is called The Big Ones, The World Record Smallmouth Bass of Dale Hollow, which he published mm -hmm. in 2009. And if you're interested in the world's largest smallmouth bass, uh, you need to pick up those books. They're, they are that good, that cool. Darren Shell is uh, any, any region of the country would be honored to have a guy like Darren Shell uh, writing about them. Yep. Yeah, and you know, usually it's at this point in the story that, that, that you know, we've, we aim to slam the door. But unfortunately, uh, this is where we're gonna drop one more bomb. Uh, and it's gonna be interesting to see what happens with the story after this is, uh, is said so ken why don't you fill us in yeah uh we've been promising a bombshell and and i think we're we're going to deliver it right here terry when i did all this research and wrote the story of the hayes bass the fish was reinstated as a world and state record but i held something back uh something pretty significant maybe i was right to do it maybe i was wrong uh i had my reasons and we'll we'll go over those in a, in a minute or two here but yep. uh, we're going to reveal a big secret right now. If you watched or listened to the first episode in this three-part series, you saw the beginning of this next clip, and you saw the end of this next clip, but you didn't see the middle. We held that back. And, and that's actually where this clip is perhaps the most interesting. So here is David Hayes in 2010 telling the story of netting, landing his world record smallmouth bass. So all this time I was thinking about how I'm going to get this fish in the boat. So I banged on the door and got the wife awake again and she came out. I gave her the fastest instructions you ever heard on holding the rod, and I loosened the drag up in case he took a notion to go. And uh, I told her where to stand, how to hold the rod. And my plan was, I had a outrigger with the motor on the back of the boat. My plan, plan was to get one foot out on that and have my net already wet and spin the wheel on the boat and let it float around so the fish would float over my net and it worked so when he got the fish close to the boat hayes handed the rod to his wife ruth and then maneuvered the boat so that he could get a net under it exactly 
Letting someone else touch the rod during the fight is a violation of IGFA and Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame rules, right? No question about it. It's a, it's a good rule, too. I think we both agree with that. People other than the angler should not be handling the rod for a record catch. Yeah, and yeah, I, I agree with that a, a hundred percent. But you know, why didn't you tell that part of the story in two thousand five? Yeah, there were a couple of reasons. Um, first and foremost, when I got into the story, I didn't know about it. Uh, but when I you didn't know about the rule? I, no, I knew about the rule. I didn't know about that aspect of landing of the fish that that Mrs. Hayes held the rod while David Hayes scooped up the fish. And I felt that Mr. Hayes had been put through the ringer mm -hmm. on this on this record keeping thing. Uh, right. And I felt like he had been unfairly maligned for something that he didn't do. He didn't right. load a fish with weights. Yeah. Not only was he innocent of that, but I don't believe that ever happened. I believe he caught a legitimate 11 pound, 15 ounce smallmouth bass. And I believe he deserved to be recognized for it. Uh, mm -hmm. Another reason was, you know, IGFA, Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame, rules <coughs> rules like that uh, about no one other than the angler touching the rod, they did not apply in 1955 when Field and Stream was keeping oh, no. freshwater records. There was nothing about that in any of the fresh or the, the Field and Stream r rules. Okay, nothing. So, so it's, you know, and, and if IGFA is going to be... Or, if they're going to do the right thing, they're going to grandfather that in based upon the field and stream rules at the time. And that's exactly what I believe. I, I didn't believe in 2005 when I was talking to Mr. Hayes for the first time or 2010 when we did that video interview. Uh, and I certainly don't believe now that they should disqualify his record just because he did not comply with standards that were not even in place when he caught the fish. You know, it's mm -hmm. my opinion that when IGFA took over the records from Field and Stream in 1978 uh, and, and, and the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame started keeping records in the mid-70s, that, that IGFA and the Hall of Fame took over those records at face value. They inherited those records. And, and they should not, without evidence of fraud, fraud, be able to disqualify it. And that statement is going to come up in a later series that we're going to be doing uh, regarding another world record fish. So Yes, it is. You, you chose your words carefully there, Ken. Indeed, <laughs> sir. I, I try to. I try. Uh, so why did you want to tell this part of the story now? Well, for one thing, uh, Mr. Hayes is gone. He died in 2020 at the age of 95, uh, and he got to enjoy his record for a very long time. Yep. For another reason, I, I we talked about it. I think his record should be grandfathered in, um, and I don't. So I don't think his record should be touched. Uh, but the main reason is because this is the Big Bass Podcast. You know, this is something that you and I are embarking on together, and with Nathan. And, uh, and our goal has been and will always continue to be slamming the door on every story we tell. And that means covering it A to Z, top to bottom, soup to nuts, yep. so, that, so that nobody else can find any meat on the bone to tell any part of the story because we've already covered it all. And, and to do that, to slam the door, that means we've got to do it with all the information we have, positive or negative, popular or unpopular. Yeah. So what happens if this leads to IGFA and the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame, you know, booting Hayes' record? I think that'd be a tremendous injustice. Uh, I agree with that. I'd also like to think that, that these record-keeping organizations are smart enough not to decertify the Hayes catch just because he didn't meet the modern standards. Uh, and I think that everybody who cares about bass fishing, and in particular smallmouth bass fishing, knows the magic number is 1115. 
It's 11.15. It's not 10.14 like the Gorman fish or no. 10.8 like the Beal fish or the Smith fish. And, and honestly, I think those record-keeping organizations would probably do more damage to their own reputations by taking the Hayes bass out of the record books. None of these record-keeping organizations has a, a sterling or stellar reputation, at least not in the bass world. And in that bass world, I think the Hayes catch is more important than they are. That's my opinion, and I'm sure it's not their opinion, but I believe it is the opinion of, of bass anglers around the world. Um, a little earlier, I read a, a passage from that letter that uh, IGFA sent to David Hayes, letting him know that he was back in the record book. And, uh, and the key part of that letter said, uh, IG, it is IGFA's policy has always been to reinvestigate any record when information is presented challalenging its legitimacy. We're going to find yeah. out what that means. And, and hopefully, I mean, it's, it's my opinion that, that they don't take it out of the record books, you know. Um, but, you know, that's not up to us. You know, all we can do is, you know, present the story. Um, and, and what better way to present it than through the lips or the mouth of the man that caught the fish, you know. Yeah. Hayes had no reason to hide anything, in, in my opinion. I mean, hell, he didn't even go watch the fish get weighed at either marina you know he was just he had no clue that he had caught the world record didn't you know, know he caught was... the world record didn't know that it might be called into question if he handed the rod to his wife uh yep. his his boat was such that he had to spin the wheel spin the steering wheel to get it to swing around so he could reach the fish with a net yep. and uh and the only way to do that was to hand the rod off yep. um so uh, I hope he's not decertified too. It would be yeah. a it would be an injustice in my opinion. Yep, absolutely. So well, hey, I think uh, we have covered everything that there is to cover with this story. Uh, way more than anybody else has ever covered with respect to this fish, uh, which means I guess that we finally get to slam the door on the David Hayes world record smallmouth bass. Uh, so. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for listening to the Big Bass Podcast. Uh, before we go, uh, I'd like to remind you folks to uh, subscribe, hit the like button, uh, share the podcast with your friends. Uh, you know, we love interacting with you all in the comments section uh, on YouTube. Uh, so drop us a comment. Um, every little bit of support helps. Uh, it helps us to grow the channel uh, and helps us to bring, you know, these stories in the depth that we go into. Uh, for everybody to, to, to listen to. Uh, don't forget to check out the website at thebigbasspodcast.com. Uh, on the website, you'll find the calculator uh, and listings of record bass, uh, state records, and uh, you know for all three species, uh, largemouth, smallmouth, and spots. We'll have more going up onto the website uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, and if you want to contact us, uh, our email addresses are Ken at TheBigBassPodcast.com, Terry at TheBigBassPodcast.com, and Nathan at TheBigBassPodcast.com. I'm Terry Battisti, and on behalf of my partners, Ken Duke and Nathan Benson, thank you for joining us. Be sure to check back next week. We'll have a new show about a different Big Bass with a story that you will not and cannot find anywhere else. And remember, size matters.